Welcome everyone to a video tutorial in which we're discussing supporting the power system and troubleshooting computers. And this is content to help you prepare for your CompTIA A plus certification exams and in general hardware and software troubleshooting in the IT world. In this lesson I will describe some of the methods and devices for keeping a system cool as well as how to select a power supply to meet the power needs of our systems. We'll also go over the general problem solving technique and the steps that are needed in a general problem solving approach. And In this lesson I will also try to talk a little bit about mobile devices as these are part of our daily problem solving issues that we face in the IT world in whatever organization you're in. We're not only looking at the traditional desktops, uh, we've moved into laptops in our daily lives as well as the use of mobile tablets and the mobile devices, especially with the inclusion of BYOD or bring your own device to work uh, complexity that's occurred in the last several years in which we are having to try to support people's personal devices that they're using for business needs as well. So let's go ahead and dive on into this lesson. Now overheating is a bad thing, especially when it comes to our electronic components. Specifically in our devices, if the processor, the expansion cards, and other components overheat, our overall system beca could become unstable and our components can fail or start to fail and become permanently damaged. And that is obviously something we wish to avoid. Thankfully we're not recreating the wheel and all we need to do is look at our various cooling methods and devices. Some of those devices used to cool our systems are CPU and case fans. And you can see I've listed a few of those here. You can just see the differences in those. Uh, we have coolers, we have heat sinks, we have liquid cooling systems, and of course we have the thermal compound that we apply to our processor. And that is listed here at the bottom. And what we do here is we apply this whenever we're putting a processor back on because this will help to conduct heat away from the processor onto the cooler heat sink. Some people like to live wild and they put don't put this on. Please don't be one of those people. You'll usually find out the best process is to put on the thermal compound and your system will not overheat when it comes to the heat of the processor that's being created. Now the role of the cooler consists of a fan and a heat sink. And typically these coolers are made of aluminum and or a combination of copper. Another style we have uh, that some people are using but I haven't seen a lot of them yet on a larger spectrum are the fanless CPU coolers. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as a passive CPU cooler. And typically these contain heat pipes with vapor that draw heat away from the CPU towards the fins on the cooler. So this might be something you want to try out. These can range, uh, as can any coolers, range anywhere from the cheap end, you know, you can find some under $20, or you might be spending you know, around $200 for a decent cooler. So there's lots of options. Just make sure you're finding one that's right for your system. Make sure as you are moving away from the standard uh, free one that comes with your PC, if you go to move away from that, make sure that you take the measurements and make sure that yours will fit in your systems before you go and order it and maybe drop a bunch of money that you may or may not be able to recover. Now a typical good processor cooler is going to maintain a temperature of anywhere between 90 and 110 degrees or for those of you that are on the Celsius scale anywhere from 32 to 43 degrees Celsius. Now, typically when we talk about these specific parts the cooler is going to sit directly on top of the processor and it's going to consist if you recall me saying this earlier of a fan and a heat sink. The heat sink is going to be composed of those fins that you will see and these fins typically draw that heat away from the processor and then once that heat gets pulled away from the processor 
the fan is going to blow that heat away from the CPU unit as a whole out into your system and then hopefully you have a system fan that's set up correctly and the airflow is set up correctly so that that hot air will then be moved away from the system out of the case and out into the open space away from your computer so that your computer doesn't overheat. This is a process we want to make sure that we maintain and we keep our processor below the maximum temperature. Typically people, especially gamers who want to go in and build their systems, don't think of heat as one of their top priorities and they find out that their systems overheat. They don't put on the thermal paste, they don't have proper cooling set up in their system, and they spend all of this money into building the system so they can do their gaming and then it overheats right away. So make sure you don't fall into that pitfall. Another thing that happens unfortunately is people don't keep their systems clean. This happens all the time. Dust builds up so we need to make sure that we have some type of preventive maintenance to where we are going inside our systems, taking some compressed air, blowing out the dust away from our machines, whether it be a laptop or a desktop computer, and make sure that we keep this dust away. Typically, don't work, do this in like a server room because you don't want that debris getting into your servers, but you do need to keep these machines clean. There's lots of things we need to do to prevent this buildup and from... When we get that build up, getting rid of it so that we keep our systems running and maintaining them at a proper performance level. As I said, when it comes to our processor cooler, they're typically made of aluminum or copper or a combination of both. And you can see how the fans are made of some type of aluminum here. And this cooler fan gets its power from the motherboard, typically using a four pin header on the motherboard so make sure that you when you install one of these or you take one off to clean it that you make sure that you are plugged back in before setting on turning on your system otherwise your fans not going to work you're not going to get the heat away from your pro your processor as it needs to be and then you will typically have a overheat and you'll s usually see your system just shut down so make sure that you have that four pin auxiliary power plugged in on your motherboard that four pin fan header and it's typically documented on the motherboard it will be labeled so you can get that plugged in the right spot best process though is to always document what you're doing as you're disassembling or reassembling that way you have something to go against um, I've, I've seen people take pieces apart and then they don't remember how to get it back together take pictures I can't stress that enough take pictures for your documentation if you're in a larger environment make sure that you are taking pictures documenting the steps and include this in a knowledge base article in your ticketing system now the case fans as I said earlier are very important because they help draw air out of the case to prevent overheating now most cases have one or more positions on the case to hold a case fan typically and this is just common sense when you think about it large fans tend to perform better than small fans because of the amount of air they can draw away or draw out of our system cases. Some other components that sometimes need cooling based on our systems are our video cards. Our graphic cards put off a lot of heat, especially higher end ones that are cost you hundreds upon hundreds of dollars to have. So you, if you're looking into those, you want to make sure based on your requirements if that needs to be cooled and some of these just will automatically be shipped from good companies such as NVIDIA that are designed to, for that cooling so make sure that you're getting one and make sure sometimes you need to get some that don't have a fan you can get fan cards that can be mounted next to a graphics card just be sure to select a fan card that fits the expansion slot that you plan to use so make sure you know your motherboard and know your available expansion slots prior to ordering. Sometimes even our RAM needs to be cooled. Typically these are going to clip over a, one of your DIMM memory modules or multiple modules and then they will be powered by a SATA or even a 4-pin Molex power connector to the motherboard to get their power. I've shown you an example of one here to the right that's pretty extreme, hence the name. Now liquid cooling is a whole beast in its own. 
Typically a small pump sits inside the case and tubes move liquid around the components and then away from them to place to a place wherever your fans cool the liquid. Kind of like the way a car, car radiator might work in, in essence that we have liquid moving through for our cooling system. We have a whole system set up. As you can see here on the left, we have that liquid cooling system. And here's an example of one that's actually been implemented. You can see the fans that are working. You can see how we're going through the processor, our video card. We're running and cooling all around our system. And then the air is then keeping that circulated. This could take a lot of power and this can cost a lot of money. So it's up to you as to if you want to implement liquid cooling systems. Now let's talk a little bit about power supplies. So typically our systems are going to have our power supply unless we're building. So we need to know which power supply is correct for our system. And why would we ever need to change a power supply? Well you might need to replace a power supply in case the power supply in your existing system fails for some reason. Perhaps you didn't have it properly protected with a UPS or a surge protector. This happens a lot. Perhaps the power supply in your existing system is not adequate due to some upgrades that you've recently performed or you are going to plan to perform. Typically when you are building from scratch, some cases are going to come with power supplies already installed and some are not. You're going to have to make sure that you match the form factor and the power requirements for the system that you're building. You also need to know what specific power connectors that you need for your system. As you can see in the picture in the right there, the connectors typically come with your power supply and you have a plethora of them to know for the system that you're building. You don't want to have a system that takes a 24 pin and you buy one that take that has an old 20 pin or you have an old 20 pin motherboard connector and you think you can upgrade it and you get a nice you know four hundred dollar power supply and it has a 24 pin motherboard power connector so just or you don't have the right expansion card PCIe connectors that you need just be careful when you're ordering you also need to know if you have it if you require the dual voltage options. Not all come with the dual voltage option and if you're traveling, if you might be going to another country, you might need to switch over to 220. Make sure that you're checking out reviews because you want to make sure about the possible warranty on the product as well as the overall quality of the device that you're buying. So make sure to plan accordingly. Well, one of the things we need to plan on obviously is our correct wattage. So we need to determine the wattage capacity. So consider all those components that are inside the case or will be in the case. Consider your USB and FireWire devices uh, because you're going to get power from the ports that are connected to the motherboard. Video cards obviously draw the most power so make sure that you're planning for that. Your power supply should be rated about 30 percent higher than the expected needs. So Add up the wattage requirements for all of the components that are going to require power in your device and then add about 30% onto that. Once you've added that 30%, then select your power supply. You know, your system fans can run anywhere around 5 watts. Uh, the motherboard processor, memory keyboard and mouse, that type of device, anywhere from 200 to 300 watts. Uh, your optical drive, such as your DVD or Blu-ray drive, are going to be anywhere from 20 to 30 watts. PCI video cards on the low end, 50 watts. PCI, you know, PCI Express times 16, that's not a video card. There's another 100 watts. Maybe a PCIe. Times 16 video car can be anywhere from 150 to 300 watts. You need to list all that, get the specs, list all that, total it up, and then add about 30% on there. Well, that's a little bit about the hardware. Well, sometimes that hardware goes bad. So how do we approach a hardware problem? Now, typically for the IT world, we have a six-step troubleshooting process. You need to identify the problem. You need to establish a theory of probable cause. Once you've got that theory established, test that theory to determine the actual cause. Step four, you're going to establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement your solution. Next, you want to verify that that solution worked and that the full system functionality has been restored. And if there are any type of 
preventive measures that need to be put in place, whether it's you know informing a customer, educating them, or if there's something you need to do, such as let's say install a UPS because of the root problem was a power issue was created because there was no type of surge protection. And then lastly, once you've done that, you need to document the findings, your actions, and the outcomes. We need to document, document, document in the IT world. Well, if we're going to be troubleshooting a problem, before we can even get into that, we're going to identify a problem, we need to troubleshoot. So one of the main areas of resources that we have available to us is the good old internet. Uh, you can find so many solutions as to what caused the problem, or if you see this issue, this issue popping up other places. There's probably forums out there. Uh, vendor websites may have stuff out there. Check uh, any, if the manufacturer has some type of diagnostic software that you can download and use. Uh, another troubleshooting resource we have available to us is our user manuals and typically those are in a PDF style or you might just be an HTML only where it's online as a resource. An example of this is with Apple devices rather than calling support you can go on and use their knowledge base articles, which is what their phone support is doing anyway, is taking the keywords from your phone call and typing those into the knowledge base to find out articles that are related to troubleshooting your issue. And there might be other technical associates in your organization that you can lean on to get helpful information from in this troubleshooting process. And when we go to approach our hardware problem, there's several other steps we need to do other than just this six step troubleshooting process. When we're approaching that hardware problem, we need to interview the customer, find out what's going on, what's changed. So sometimes we'll typically find at that step, we can determine what the problem is, but we don't want to jump to conclusions. Before we make any changes, we need to back up the data as needed. This is critical. Make sure you always back up the data before making any changes, especially if you're moving a hard drive or replacing the power, anything you're doing, make sure that you back up the data. Then examine the system and establish some type of theory. And that's where we've moved into step two. So just identifying the problem has several steps in it. Make sure you follow those. Now I said I would talk about mobile devices as well. When it comes to your mobile devices, whether it's iPhones, uh, your Dell tablets, any type of tablets, your Microsoft Surface, you know, two-in-ones, whatever the case may be, before starting a repair project, consider a few things. All right, is it under warranty? If it's under warranty, don't touch it. Let, let the manufacturer take care of any type of repairs. Another thing, what about the time that the repair will take? Is it cost effective to do a repair? Uh, you can go to like ifixit.com or whatever and you might find the steps. You might have to you know, order the kit for removing like the screens. That's on our mobile devices. That's the number one thing that goes wrong, right? Is the screens get cracked. So there are steps out there. I fix it. You know, we'll go out and they'll figure out how to tear things apart and repair such things. You might have, you know, you, there's other things you're going to have to buy. So is it worth that? Is it time for an upgrade? So maybe there's no need to spend the time and the money to do the repair. You know, maybe there's something like on a device that you can repair with an external device. Let's say you have a tablet and the NIC goes bad, you can't get wireless. But you have a USB port, you can get a USB wireless adapter, and there's your replacement, and there's your repair, and it's done. You've replaced the internal device with an external device because that substitution has got you up and running. Let's talk a little bit about electrical system problems. These usually occur, or they can occur, before or after the boot of our computer. And unfortunately, electrical problems are hard to troubleshoot because they can be consistent, and we can know that it's going to happen every time, or it can be intermittent. So some possible symptoms you might detect when coming across a electrical problem is that your computer appears to be dead. It's not working. Sometimes it locks up during the boot process, or perhaps you hear error codes, or see error codes, or hear error beeps during your boot process. Hopefully not, but you can smell burnt parts or odors. When you do this, it definitely know it's an electrical problem because it's a smell or an odor all of its own. You will definitely know an electrical odor when you come across it. Perhaps your computer powers down at unexpected times. Possible electrical problem. 
perhaps your computer appears dead, except you hear a whine coming from the power supply. You hear that fan whining on the power supply. You know you have an electrical problem with your power supply unit. If you do smell burnt parts, don't turn your system on. Find the fried part and replace it. If your power supply is whining, as I just mentioned, don't turn the system on. Open the case, look for the short, or consider upgrading your power supply. Typically, this is the best process. Just replace the power supply. You, there are power supply testers out there. You can go one by one and test your power supply. You can see if it's putting out the right amount of electricity, perhaps it's not producing any, maybe you can just troubleshoot and find a specific power element that is bad on that. One of your connectors is bad. Uh, check your power cord connections and maybe your your power bar on your laptop, maybe it's not plugged in correctly. Maybe the outlet is on a hot switch and you're not getting power. You're like, what's going on? Then you find out you have a hot switch. You go to the wall, you flip the switch up and all of a sudden you have power. Typically you can identify these because when they're installed in homes the outlet is turned upside down. This is typically a hot switch but that is going to vary based on electricians. One of the most common problems I see when troubleshooting electrical systems is that the circuit has been tripped, the circuit breaker, and you just go find the box, flip the breaker back on, and you're good. But then you need to troubleshoot why that was tripped. Perhaps your system overheated. Uh, perhaps if you got an old computer that if you're in an environment they've got a really old computer there might be some EMI or electromagnetic interference that's causing this issue to occur. We don't typically see this anymore but you might come across it. If your system's overheating you might see something as your system hangs or freezes at odd times after the boot process has occurred. Maybe you're even getting a BSOD or blue screen of death which we all hate that but if that occurs during the boot, that could be from your system overheating. Uh, if you hear the fan making a whining noise, that is definitely one to look at. Or you cannot feel the air being pulled into and out of the case from your system case fans. Even on a laptop, if you don't feel the air being pushed out, there's a problem that you're, you're going to start of an overheating problem there. Now there are temperature sensors you can buy, uh, and we use these in the IT world a lot, especially if you're working in anywhere that has like uh, cooling um, rooms that need to be cooled or even refrigerators you can buy these temperature sensors that can be on your network that will send out like messages if there is a problem with the t it's gotten out of the temperature range that you have set there could be a problem with the electrical system maybe the, there's an area in your building that has lost power that you need to respond to because there's a reason you had that temperature sensor in place when it comes to this troubleshooting process one thing I can say that holds true almost anywhere I go, check the simple things first. Some of the most simple things you would think would not happen are the problems, such as, oh, I, I don't have any, I can't get on the internet. And then you look and it's a desktop, they don't have a wireless network adapter. You look back there, trace the cord for the ethernet cable and it's not plugged in. Or, oh, my monitor's not working. And you look and it's not plugged in, there's not getting any power, or it's been, not fully inserted into the monitor so they're not getting the electrical signal to the monitor to display. So check the simple things first. A couple more things about our mobile devices when we're troubleshooting those. Perhaps you have a cell phone it's overheating. Check and see on the device where the heat's coming from. If it's coming from the bottom of the cell phone where perhaps the battery is located. If this is the case, if it's hot around the battery, maybe you need to change your AC adapter for charging your battery. Also take your battery out and examine it for any type of damage. And if it's no longer under warranty, you may need to contact the manufacturer or your subscriber and get a new battery for that. Don't let that go. If heat's coming from other areas of your mobile device, uh, perhaps there's too many apps that are open and it's just processing a lot. Uh, so follow troubleshooting sh steps for your phone's operating system. There's a reason they're out there. Make sure that you use the documentation or get online with the chat representative and see what the troubleshooting steps for your phone's operating system are. Your phone processor might be overworked. Shut it down, allow it to cool, start it back up. Definitely never leave your mobile device out in the direct sunlight. Uh, you will find out that that is uh, bad in the not only long term, but a lot of times the short term. 
if your phone is in a case and it's hot, take it out of that case, let it cool down. Perhaps that is the root cause. If you have a frozen system, it will not respond to the touch screen. There's lots of things that could be wrong with that, but for the most part, uh, try to reset the device. I'm not saying do a factory reset where you lose everything, just you know, shut it down, let it start back up. Uh, reboot the system you know, based on your device, whether it's a Windows phone, an iPhone, an Android device, whatever the case may be, you know, such as with a iPhone, if you can, hold the power button and then slide the power bar over to let it shut down or, or restart. For most of your other phones, just hold the power button down until it shuts off and then allow it to cool and then start it back up. Perhaps your battery isn't holding as long as you want. It could be the AC adapter or the battery. Once again, if the device is under warranty, send it back in, let the manufacturer resolve the issue. Well, thank you everyone. That is it for this lesson on power systems and trouble, some basic troubleshooting of computers and mobile devices. I talked a lot about power and electrical and different types of devices, cooling methods, troubleshooting, and the overall troubleshooting process. Thank you for following along. I hope you found the information helpful, and I hope you continued studies in, for preparing for your A-plus certification go well. And I thank you for checking out my video and following along.